One of the most important changes since 1992 is that the governance issues related to forests have really come out of the closet. Um, environmental governance was an important part of the Rio Declaration in 1992. Principle 10, for example, was about access to information, participation in decision making, and access to justice related to environmental matters. And I think those principles have increasingly been applied in the context of forest management. So 20 years ago, for example, it was really hard to talk about illegal logging. That really only came to the fore about 10 years ago. Uh, but now people are talking about corruption, people are talking about indigenous people's rights, um, transparency of information is all uh, in the air about, about uh, forest management. So I think forest governance is really one of the, the big issues that's come to the fore in the last 20 years. I'd say the second change has been a, a shift in influence to the importance of forest-based ecosystem services. You know, 20 years ago, the debate was really about using forests for the production of timber versus you know, conserving forests for the protection of biological diversity. Both of those are still important, but now the, the third big thing that's on the table is ecosystem services and their importance. I'd say this started a little more than 10 years ago with the initiation of the Millennium Ecosystem assessment which really helped conceptualize and put some numbers behind the importance of ecosystem services of all kinds but including forest-based ecosystem services and the extent to which that they were they were under threat um, but of course more recently with the advent of red reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation have put the ecosystem service of carbon storage very much uh, to the fore as an objective of forest management so I think that's a big change from 20 years ago um, in what we value forests for I'd say the third change, there are many to choose from, but I would probably have to say changes in technology. I mean, the ability to do satellite-based you know, monitoring of a forest change has enabled you know, the real-time monitoring of forest fire hotspots, for example, or you know, where land use change is happening. And the publication of that data, making it available to the broad public, really allows a degree of engagement in both knowing what the status and trends of forests are, but also a public engagement in making decisions about what affects those trends. And so when I think about you know, what's changed here in Indonesia, all of those three trends have come together, for example, in the discourse and practice about the moratorium on new licenses for forest conversion. That moratorium put into place about a year ago um, includes an indicative uh, moratorium map which lays out in one place you know, what we know about the forest status and, and um, and legal status, and it, technology has enabled better data. Um, the, the reason we're making these maps is, is a valuing of the ecosystem service of, of carbon storage, and it's better governance that has allowed these maps to be disclosed to the public on the internet. So forest governance, ecosystem services, and, and better technology all coming together to improve forest management. Well, I wouldn't be telling the truth if I said that we weren't disappointed when we saw the seven roundtables being put forward for special attention uh, at Rio and the fact that forests wasn't one of them. But the truth is, I think it was a blessing in disguise because it's really forced us to think hard about how to make forest relevant to many of the other issues that have been foregrounded for special attention at Rio Plus 20. And if I had to pick three that would be the most significant opportunities for forward progress, I would first say the relationship between forests and food security. Um, in the past, there's been a, a characterization of forests and, and food as if there's a zero-sum trade-off, that forests have to be sacrificed for agricultural expansion if we're going to be able to feed the world. But in fact, that's way too simplistic, and in fact, in many ways, conserving forests is one of the best ways to protect food security. I mean, we know that forests provide a direct source of nutrition for many communities in and around forests, but also a source of cash income with which to buy food and C4's research has done a pretty good job of quantifying just how significant those two, two factors can be. For example, whether it's the contribution of bush meat to uh, nutrition in the Congo Basin countries or whether it's the proportion of income that comes from, from forest-based income sources that our Poverty and Environment Network research partners have, have generated. 
Um, so I think that Rio plus 20 provides an opportunity to really get past that debate about forest versus food and talk about how an optimization of land use for forests and food um, is best achieved. So that's, that's the first one. I'd say the second opportunity, which is related to forests and food security, is to increase the understanding of the relationship between forests and water. There's been a lot of research linking the maintenance of natural forest cover with both the quality and quantity of water flows to serve other human needs. And while there's still some controversies in that research, it's becoming increasingly clear that forests are important in maintaining hydrological regimes at local scales, at landscape scales, and even at continental scales. So some recent research that's been published has really made clear about how forests um, can influence hydrological regimes and, and rainfall patterns at the continental scale. So for example, rainfall that's generated out of the Amazon forests providing the, the rainfall that waters the agricultural crops in the Brazilian breadbasket. So I think those kinds of relationships are poorly understood in the general public and, and now is a very good time to, to raise awareness about the relationship between forests and water. If I had to pick a third one, I would say it would be the relationship between forests and natural disasters. Um, the world is pretty well informed now about the relationship between forests and climate mitigation. Everybody's talking about red and the need to reduce forest, uh, deforestation and forest degradation as a way of controlling climate emissions. But I think many people haven't gotten the email yet about the relationship between forests and adaptation to climate change. And clearly with the anticipated effects of climate change being increases in temperature, increases in the uh, in high intensity rainfall events, um, increases in the risk, frequency and severity of, of major, um, you know, severe events like storms. Forests can play a role in mitigating the impacts of all of those and helping society adapt to increased climate variability as well as climate change in the long term. And I also think that forests, the, the, the synergies available between forests as a source of climate mitigation as well as adaptation strategies remains underappreciated. So for example, here in Indonesia, our research has focused on the role of peat swamp forests and mangrove forests as um, very important sources of carbon storage that when disturbed produce you know, a disproportionate amount of carbon emissions. But what's probably underappreciated is the role of intact peat swamp forests in reducing the risk of forest fires, for example, from longer and drier dry seasons, or in the case of mangrove swamps, helping to attenuate the impact of storm events um, on coastal areas. So for all of those reasons, I think that the relationship between forests and natural disasters is one that we need to raise awareness of at Rio Plus 20.